What is astronomy's greatest challenge? What would be my priorities for NASA? And which astronomy binoculars do I recommend to get started? All this and more in this week's Overtime Question Show. Hey everyone, welcome to the Summer Question Show. This is of course the overtime questions that we recorded throughout the year and were not released to the public until now. We pulled them out of the vault just for you. So uh, we're going to be a couple more weeks of some of these questions that were done just during the live streams and then are made hidden. And so you can watch those. Then we'll be back in September with more new shows. Now, I got a chance to see meteors and auroras just last night, and I want to talk about it. But we'll do that at the end of the show. All right, let's get into this week's overtime questions. Jen McSweeney, what do you feel is the most challenging part of astronomy? Astronomy is one of the few sciences, maybe the only science that you can't do experiments, you can only make observations. And so when you think about biology, like you can make observations, but you can also do experiments, um, you can experiment in the lab, you can run controlled experiments in the wild, you know, maybe archaeology is the same, right? But it gets more history. But chemistry, you're, it's all in the lab, you're running these experiments, material science, all that's, but with astronomy, all you can do is observe the universe and then try to figure out what's going on through your observations. And so a whole field of, of doing experiments is just not available to astronomers in the same way. Now they come up with incredibly clever ideas for ways to test out their ideas. But at the end of the day, it's always just different kinds of observations. So I would say that is the most challenging part for sure. Brooklyn Graham, what do you think about this planet nine theory? So this is a good example where I am just a journalist, not a scientist. And so the opinions that I have about Things like Planet Nine are, are meaningless. They're worthless. I have no opinions. But I can tell you that astronomers believe that there is a object in the outer solar system corresponding to something with like the mass of Earth, maybe with the mass of Uranus or Neptune, but but farther away. And the way they think this thing is there is through the gravitational interactions that this object is having with their environment. So there are plenty of objects in the Kuiper belt that are being jiggled around by the gravity of various objects by Neptune, and then something seems to be clearing and causing a space in the orbit out in the Kuiper belt, but they haven't been able to find the actual object that's causing this. And in fact, you know, this technique has been used in the past. When astronomers found Neptune, they calculated its position, they knew the motions of Uranus, and they figured, well, there must be an object that is large in the outer solar system that's causing the changes to Uranus, look here, and you should find it. And they looked there and they found it. So this technique works. It's just that so far, all of the surveys to be able to find this object haven't turned it up. But, you know, as the years go by and more and more precise measurements are made of all these different objects in the Kuiper belt, they're getting a much better sense that this object must be there. They, you know, what its mass must be to cause this influence. And so we're waiting for powerful new telescopes to come along, they're going to be able to survey a much larger region. Because when you think about things, even like the James Webb Space Telescope, it's like looking through a tiny straw, at this tiny little spot in the sky, it's not a great survey instrument, it's very powerful. So once someone finds it with something like say Vera Rubin, where it is in the sky, then they can pass this object off to all the different telescopes in the world, and they can start to observe it. But until someone actually finds it, uh, it's all just all they know is through its gravitational effect on the other worlds. Yeah, girl, Junie, thoughts on Project Lyra. So Project Lyra, this is the idea of chasing down a Oumuamua. Uh, and we could still do it like when Oumuamua passed through the inner solar system, it was like, what? Interstellar object? what are we going to do? Oh, well, it's moving away from us. There's nothing we can do. Well, it turns out there is something we can do. We can go and try to do a flyby. And in fact, you know, the window is still open to catch up with Oumuamua. But it requires still requires speed. So the best idea that's been proposed so far, this is this project Lyra, Lyra. And so you take like a Falcon Heavy, and then you make this tiny little chase spacecraft that will do the actual flyby. And you can go directly just chase down Oumuamua with this giant rocket, 
Another possibility is you do an orbit maneuver. So you fly really close to the sun, accelerate when you're close to the sun, and that can get you going even a higher velocity. You can do some flybys, like do a flyby of Jupiter or flyby of Saturn. You can add up all that velocity and you can chase down Oumuamua. It won't happen quickly. You're probably still looking at about 30 years of chasing Oumuamua before you finally get some images up close. But if we wanted to get there, if we wanted to catch up with Oumuamua, we could do it. It's just budget, right? I mean, we've talked about all the things we don't have budget to do. We can't go back. We haven't gone back to Neptune and Uranus. What about that mission that would take images of that lava lake on Io? We need a lander to go to Enceladus, and it would be great to chase down Oumuamua. So there's just there's too many priorities, not enough budget. And so we have to make sacrifices. You know, do you want those missions to Venus? Do you want the Titan dragonfly? Uh, so I think the the right balance, the compromise is going to be the interstellar interceptor. And this is a mission that the European Space Agency is working on. It's going to go probably in 2028, 2029. It's going to launch with the aerial mission. It's going to go out to like the Earth Sun L2 Lagrange point, and it's just going to hang out at the Lagrange point and wait for the perfect opportunity. And so when another interstellar object is on its way into the inner solar system, then it will calculate and do a flyby of this object. And so uh, you know, if we assume there will be more of these interstellar objects passing through the solar system, then it will be less expensive to just try and do a flyby of one of them. But I love the idea. Like, you know, where would it exist in my, it would be in my top 10. If you sit, had me list the 10 space exploration missions that I would like to fund, um, Project Lyra would be in that list for sure. Google, if you could whisper in the ear of NASA decision makers, what would you suggest? I mentioned what I like in the previous Space Bites this week. I talked about a um, capabilities driven framework. Uh, and the gist of this is like, don't have a goal. Don't don't like we're going to an asteroid, we're going to the moon, we're going to Mars because administrations change and priorities change and optics change. And so you're going to get one administration saying we're going to the moon and then the new administration comes in and they may want to go to the moon, but they want to just shuffle things, mix things up, look like they're more proactive and they'll pick a different goal. And then everyone's got to retool and it's a whole thing. And so instead you do a capabilities driven framework. So you just increase your capabilities step by step by step. You're increasing the amount of time you can spend in space, the ways that you can land, the kinds of resources that you can make in space, the orbital distance from the Earth, and so on and so forth. And you just you just have this checklist. Like, like think about a character sheet. Okay, this is good. Like, imagine you're playing a video game and your character has dozens of various attributes that you are getting better at in your different skills, right? Uh, You've got, say, I'm trying to think like Dark Souls, right? You, you, you're better at one handed weapons, you're better at two handed weapons and so on. And you're just trying to increase this capability. And after a while, as you get more and more powerful, you're able to take on different foes, because you've got all of these skills that you've been able to level up across the system, as opposed to you have no skills, you have none of that kind of stuff, your only job is to defeat the end boss. And there's no sort of in between phase, you're, you're gathering together whatever other requirements to defeat the end boss, but you're not um, you're not building your overall capabilities. And so if you run across some other boss, uh, you don't have the capability to defeat them. And so that's why in video games this kind of progression is a lot more fun and works a lot better. And I think that progression works well. I mean, that progression works well in our regular lives. Um, we don't know what our giant goal is going to be. We have many goals, big goals, small goals, but it's good to get enough sleep, eat healthy food, have meaningful relationships with people that you enjoy spending time with, develop interesting hobbies and build your skills, languages, build your personal savings, buy things that make you happy, 
and you build your overall capability as a human being in this world to deal with, you know, so that you can be resilient as things change, as opposed to just this narrow laser focus on this one goal. Uh, it's, it's always kind of dangerous to do that. So yeah, that's my that if I could whisper in their ear, I'd be like, read the capabilities driven framework documents that you created back in 2014. That was gold. Do that. Andres Gutierrez, anyone have good recommendations for telescope around $200. So you can get fairly small reflectors, Newtonian reflectors, um, like a three inch reflector uh, for around $200 or less. And they're they're fairly small, they look like a small Dobsonian telescope. They're like tabletop Celestron makes I think a Celestron first scope. Maybe it's even cheaper than that. And it's pretty good. Um, it's got a the tube is made of cardboard, but it's got a proper mirror on the back and it's got a little eyepiece. And I had one do I still have one? No, I got rid of it. Okay. Um, I think I donated it to a school. Um, it has a, uh, you know, you can see the rings of Saturn, you can see the moons of Jupiter, you can see the bands on the planet of Jupiter. So there's that route. The other route is to build your own for like $200. If, if you're handy, you can build a Dobsonian, you get like a six inch mirror, I would go used. So, you know, go on to Facebook. I'm trying to think of any other place that people are going to sell used telescopes that you can trust. I would go to a local astronomical society um, and get to know the people at the astronomical society and see if somebody is willing to sell a telescope at some point. Uh, in many cases, they're buying a new telescope and they've got an older one that they're going to get rid of. So, um, so you should be able to do that. Visto 2D binoculars. What is the sweet spot between magnification power and size and weight? I mean, that's a personal opinion. The most important thing is the aperture. So these are the Celestron Skymasters. They are 15 by 70s. And you can see the, the 15 by 70. Um, and so what that means is they have 70 millimeter lenses here. So these are these are two 2.7 inch telescopes, right? And then uh, the 15 is the magnification. And so you're seeing 15 times the size of the object. But the thing that really matters is the aperture is to see the size of the of the of the lenses. So bigger is always better when you're getting a telescope like the, the you want to buy the most powerful the, the largest aperture telescope you can purchase. But these things are heavy. I mean, you're holding them, you're looking with them, uh, your arms get tired. So there's a, something to be said for and and they're hard to bring around. But they do have a mount that lets you mount them onto a telescope, you can see this it was onto a tripod this thing here. So you can actually mount these onto a tripod. And then you can have the tripod do your holding while you look through that. But it's not that great because you're like there's something really just you're flowing. You're just like looking around the sky. You're like, what's that over there? Oh, I'm going to check that out. What's that over there? Oh, I'm going to look over there. So it's really hard with the tripod to be able to work them in the same way. Any binoculars are better than no binoculars at all. I would say a seven by 35 pair of binoculars is great for just like seeing the Milky Way, looking at the moon. Um, you're not going to be able to see the planets like these will let me see the moons of Jupiter and the rings of Saturn, but badly, like you can just see that there are rings around Saturn, and you can just see that there are moons around Jupiter, like you see the, you know, the one blobber for Jupiter, and you see a bunch of bright dots around Jupiter, and you're like, those are the moons, the moon looks great. Uh, the Milky Way looks great. But um, and so, you know, we talked about, you know, what is the smallest telescope that you can buy for $200? I mean, these are $92 US on Amazon. And so if you've only got $200 to, to spend, get these 100 bucks, 100 bucks. And you, these get used multiple times a day in our house, mostly for looking at birds. But we use them nonstop. So that's your great first step. 
So what is the sweet spot? There is no sweet spot. Uh, the sweet spot is the heaviest binoculars you can hold and not have your arms get tired that you can afford. And Tifa Jesus, what is the leading theory on why Uranus spins sideways? So there's sort of two possibilities. One is that it was struck by something massive. Um, that would explain it. And so it tilted it over onto its side. And then the other thing is, is that we know that the giant planets in the solar system migrated during the solar system's early history by uh, quite a bit. And in fact, Uranus and Neptune switched places in their orbits. And so it could very well be that during that process where the planets were migrating outward, and Uranus and Neptune switched places that you know, as it got close, maybe they got close to each other and it the gravity pulled Uranus over onto its side. JQ, do you want to see missions to Uranus and Neptune? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would say that you know, the only time that we actually have close up pictures from Uranus and Neptune was from the Voyager spacecraft. Voyager 2 made a flyby of Uranus in 86, Neptune in 89. And that's it. And we got some great pictures, they were amazing. And we saw some pictures of the moons. But that's it. And we just haven't gone back and we haven't gone back with technology that is 50 years newer than what was sent on the Voyager spacecraft. So it's a big priority to go back and think about this. And when you think about the number of like Neptune sized planets that are being found around the Milky Way, we have a lot of gaps in our understanding. And then like Neptune's moons, Triton orbits backwards from the rest of all the other large moons in the solar system. So it was probably a captured Kuiper belt object. And in fact, we found geysers on Triton before they found geysers on Enceladus, we know that there are these dark geysers on Triton that we really need to look at. So there's been a lot of ideas, a lot of missions have been proposed to go and do a mission out to, to Neptune. The problem is it's really far away. So you're looking at a 10 year flight time not to mention the build time. So like, yeah, I would like to see a mission to Neptune. I have to be okay with the fact that it won't get there until the late 2040s. You know, well, I will be in my 60s, late 60s then. But yes, I would love to see a mission to Uranus and Neptune. You got to mine deep. Do you know any good, ideally free resources to learn some of the math aspects of astronomy? There are some open courseware astronomy textbooks that you can access on the internet. So it's Wikibooks. There's an astronomy textbook there, and they go through and have like some of the math. So definitely check that out. And then many universities, MIT, um, I don't know if some of the other ones will have like open versions of their courses that you can access for free. And in some cases, have the problem sets and things like that. But I think like the best investment is in a textbook. And you can get an older version of the textbook, like you don't need the new textbook, get one that is a couple of editions behind you can pick them up used on Amazon or order them through your library and work with them there and just start at the beginning of the textbook and work your way through the textbook, going through the problems, answering them one by one. Alexander Reinsich, why is it harder to explore the inner solar system than the outer solar system with a probe? Yeah, it is actually trickier to get closer to the sun than it is to get farther away from the sun. And this is because you have to cancel out the Earth's orbital velocity to get closer to the sun. So we are going 30 kilometers per second around the sun. And so you have to be able to cancel that velocity. Um, so really just be able to fire a rocket that is capable of going 30 kilometers per second, which we can't do. And so in order to get closer to the sun, they have to use gravitational slingshots. So if you've got a spacecraft that is attempting to get closer to the sun, you pass around Venus in a way that it slows down your spacecraft compared to the orbital velocity that you came in with. And so with multiple flybys, like sometimes five, six more, like the Parker Solar Probe has done a ton of gravitational slingshots, you can get yourself closer and closer and closer to the, the sun or Venus or Mercury or whatever, but you have to play this sort of game of space billiards to get down to that point. That's why it's always so funny when people say, Oh, why don't we just throw our nuclear waste into the sun? Like, 
The sun is the hardest place to reach in the entire solar system. It is easier it is less energy intensive to escape the solar system than it is to fly into the sun. Embus, in your opinion, what is the most likely answer to how supermassive black holes formed in the early universe? So I don't have an opinion, right? Um, I am a journalist. So allow me to present the different possible ideas that have been proposed by astronomers. So either bottom up, in other words, you had the first stars form in the universe, they detonated a supernova, they formed black holes, the black holes found each other, they merged together. And you get this exponential process, right? You get two black holes, each which has 10 times the mass of the sun, they merge with each other. Now they have 20 times the mass of the sun, they find another 20 mass of the sun. Now it's 40 times the mass of the sun, they find another 40 mass of the sun. Now they're 80 times the mass of the sun, you get up to millions and billions of times the mass of the sun with not a lot of mergers. So that's the one possibility. And then the other possibility is that the supermassive black holes formed directly in place all at one go. So you get these giant inflows of gas and dust that are coming together. And normally with the kinds of stars that we see today, when a star gets to about 100 times the mass of the sun, these big powerful stellar winds get going and they start to blast out from the star and that prevents any further material from falling down into the star. But Theoretically, those early stars were sort of pure hydrogen and helium, they weren't polluted by the metals, they may have been able to take on a lot more mass than the kinds of stars that we see today. And it could very well be there's some kind of way that the the conditions were right that you didn't get those outflowing winds or that the large concentrations of sort of material around were counteracting each other. And so you got these black holes that were able to form with more mass. But if you just like take a stellar mass black hole, and try to make it become a supermassive black hole, there isn't enough time, they don't feed quickly enough, it has to be through mergers or some weird way that black holes might have formed early on in the universe. Malik Grewell, if Voyager like spacecraft passes through our solar system from an alien civilization, would we be able to detect it? If like a Voyager pass through the solar system from another civilization? Would we detect it? No, absolutely not. It's, it's too small. And unless it is putting out some kind of bright radio transmission towards Earth, or some kind of light beam that's pointed at Earth that we would be able to see we couldn't just detect it passively. It's just it's so far and it's so small. Like astronomers can find moons that are a couple of kilometers across at Jupiter, but they know where to look. They're like, let's look at Jupiter and look in the vicinity of Jupiter for anything that's moving around Jupiter. But Voyagers are room size. So dramatically smaller. So no, no. And so like, that's one of the things is that there could be these von Neumann probes, there could be these, these robot probes moving through the solar system all the time, and we just wouldn't notice them. Arjon, would an alien civilization be held back on the lot by not having a kilonova in their system history? Yeah, I mean, I think life on Earth is dependent on the enrichment of metals that were delivered by various events in the history of the stellar nebula. Kilonova are a big part of it. It really is looking like the heaviest elements, the gold, the platinum, palladium, iridium, those are formed in kilonovae. That you don't get them from a core collapse supernova. So we really need kilonova to provide those minerals. Thomas Sadukas, could our solar system build a new planet? No, I mean, when you think about things where places where planets could form, like for example, the asteroid belt, if you took all of the mass in the asteroid belt and mashed it together, you would have a asteroid that is a fraction of the mass of the moon. So it's not even as big as the moon, it is like 5% of the mass of the moon. So there's just not a lot of mass left over. Uh, same thing, like, you, there's the same amount of mass in the Trojan belt at Jupiter. And so if you added all of the Trojan material and all of the mass of the asteroid belts, that's all the rocky material that's available in the solar system, that would get you 10% of the mass of the moon. Now you could start throwing Kuiper belt objects in there. Uh, there's plenty of them. 
and they have a certain amount of, of mass. And so yeah, you could build up a planet, you could build another Earth out of all of the leftover Kuiper belt objects and asteroids in the solar system if you wanted to. But it'd be sure tricky. All right, that was just a fraction of all of the questions that I got over the course of the entire year. But now you get a chance to see them. Now, last night, I saw both the Percy meteor shower and some amazing auroras. I want to talk about it in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Bill, David Gilton, and David Matt, Stanis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Spiderswap.io, Paul Robox, Stephen Grisaki, and Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So in this week's Space Bites, I said that you should watch the Perseids meteor shower, and I took my own advice, and we had clear skies, so I was able to watch it. And as my wife and I were going out and just getting set up to sit out and watch the meteor shower, her phone beeped and she got an aurora alert that there was going to be some aurora activity in our area. So we went outside and we looked up and the sky was like a little bit cloudy. And I was like, oh, this isn't going to be great, but we'll, we'll get through it. And then we realized that it wasn't clouds. It was auroras. And in fact, there was auroras directly overhead. And they started out sort of white and almost cloudy looking, but then they changed colors. They changed to green, they changed to pink and purple, and were just going across the just the sky directly overhead. So we weren't seeing them off on the horizon the way I normally do. They were going right overhead. And it was just amazing. And no picture captures how alive these things look. They are, it's like the whole sky is throbbing like at a nightclub. It's crazy. And, uh, and so I think, you know, you see pictures, and you're like, oh, that's really beautiful. I'd love to see it that time. But you just aren't prepared for what a really powerful Aurora storm looks like. And so if you like, if this is on your bucket list, we are approaching solar maximum. We'll probably get there summertime next year. So you've got lots of chances to go to really interesting places at various high latitudes and watch the auroras. So uh, and we saw a few Perseids. They weren't great. We saw one, though, that did like break up visibly like sparklers or something. It was pretty cool. All right. We'll see you next week.